Hi, I'm Bill Newcott, and The Railway Man is a truly moving new film starring Colin Firth and Nicole Kidman. He plays a World War II veteran who is traumatized by his time in a Japanese labor camp. She plays the wife, his wife, the woman who understands that the only way for him to come to terms with what happened to him may well be to go back and confront uh, the man who tortured him. It's a true story, and the movie is based on a book by the man who lived it, Eric Lomax. He passed away in 2012, but his wife, Patty Lomax, the one who was played by Nicole Kidman in the movie, is here with us today, as is Andy Patterson, who co-wrote the screenplay and produced the film. Welcome. Did I get that all right? I hope I didn't. I'm not talking about the wrong film, correct? On the whole. (laughs) (laughs) That's pretty good. Um, Patty, in your husband's book, it says he endured two... Uh, incurable conditions in his life. One is the love of railroads, and the other is the scars of of torture. And both of those conditions play a key role in the story. I thought you might talk a little bit about his twin obsessions, as it were. Well, the interest in the railroad started when he was very, very young, and it was a time of steam trains, and I believe his father uh, would take uh, Eric to, as a 10-year-old boy to stand on a railway bridge above the railway line uh, from Edinburgh, uh, and uh, they would watch these great engines uh, passing underneath. Mm-hmm. And I believe that's when the obsession really started. But he was not a train spotter. He was uh, very interested in the engineering of the, the trains, uh, the railroads and the engines themselves, particularly... Uh, from Victorian times, mm. when the uh, mail was pulled by stagecoach from town to town, and then it began to be taken on to the railway. And that period particularly en- uh, en- enthralled my husband. Um, and he was interested in the maps of the time. Mm. Some of them are beautiful, hand-painted maps. Mm. Um, he was also interested in the early timetables because in those days there were time differences between London and other time uh, towns in the country. And I believe that we all became uh, one as far as time is concerned because of the railways. And somehow, through a twist of fate, that, that interest in trains came into play in his time as, as a captive of the Japanese during World War Two. Yes, it was uh, quite remarkable, really. Um, he uh, was caught at Singapore, like so many others. He was a signals officer. Uh, they were moved uh, to the uh, bridge area that we now know as the bridge over the River Kwai, uh, where there was an engineering camp there. And during that time, he and some others, have, uh, as shown in the film, uh, decided it would be a good thing to make a simple um, radio receiver to try and tune into Radio India mm. and find out what was happening in the progress of the war. So that, uh, and he wasn't the only one to do that. There were other brave people up the line who were doing the same thing. Um, the idea being that it was a morale booster. Uh, if people knew a little about what was going on. But, of course, Eric's uh, group were betrayed and uh, they suffered uh, enormously, consequently. Mm-hmm. It's a story of horror, but it's also a story of forgiveness. And that's that's where you came in to his story. Because you, uh, for purposes of people who don't know the story, you came into his life much later, in the, in the 60s, right? Oh, yes. Uh, he had been married for some years and the... Marriage was very badly affected, uh, as one can imagine. It as would so many be. of them are. Yes. Um, he, he couldn't talk about his experience. And uh, because of certain other life-changing events that he experienced as soon as he came back from the war, um, he married the girl whom he'd been engaged to before he left. And I've seen letters from that time, and obviously, bless her heart, she thought she was getting the same person back Mm -hmm. that she'd fallen in love with before. And within three weeks, they were married, and she found, as I did in later years, that she was married to a totally different person, Mm -hmm. traumatized greatly by the events that he'd uh, had to go through. 
So I came on the scene uh, in 1980, uh, 50 years mm. after the war. Eric was quite a bit older than me in chronological years, but uh, he was much younger uh, in personality and looked younger too, amazingly. Mm. Um, so, uh, yes, we met on a train, <laughs> as the film depicts. That's good, because um, you know, sometimes wonder how much they... They brush it up for the movies. It's nice to know mm. that some of the nicer scenes happened, really. Well, it took a little more time to uh, fall in love. We became good friends first. Mm -hmm. But he was a great raconteur. He really knew his geography and the history of the places that we did pass through. And the attraction, uh, as he told me later, um, for him was the fact that I had a small book of maps which I was following the line with and so it wasn't the nearly beautiful me that he was interested in it was the fact that here was somebody a kindred <laughs> spirit who liked maps it was a little bit of both well yeah, yeah it's possibly <laughs> <laughs> as, as, as your relationship deepened and and you learned the the, the dark side that that lurked in there and the reasons behind it what um, at what point did he decide he had to go back to Japan and meet the people who... Had... Oh, that was a very long process. He uh, had this obsession uh, about this particular Japanese, the interpreter who had been there uh, throughout all his problems in uh, during the war. And um, it took some years. Uh, I had no idea why his behavior was as, as it was. He could be utterly charming and a lovely gentleman and then he would suddenly have a flashback through something that I had said mm. or a sound that he'd heard. Um, and eventually, after about six or seven years, he I managed to persuade him that he really could have uh, some counselling help from what, after all, was a war wound as much as anybody losing a leg is mm. wounded. So the mind is wounded, the, the veterans then, and they're still happening today. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, to try and be succinct, uh, he had counselling. It took two years. Over that time, I found out, uh, because I was present, uh, what had happened to him. And very soon after that, he was given a cutting from a Japanese English language newspaper which reviewed a book from the um, written by the uh, torture, Nagasi Takashi, uh, uh, describing the Eric's torture on uh, the in the book, and it also the cutting included a photograph of the young Nagase, mm -hmm. and uh, Eric recognised the picture immediately as being the person that. Uh, he had held in his mind all those mm. years, all that time. The book uh, was given to Eric as a gift and by one of his contemporaries. And it also included not only the description of Eric's uh, torture, but a description of an event that Mr. Nagase felt that he'd uh, experienced at one of the war cemeteries when he... Uh, uh, felt a golden light surrounding him and he felt all his evil deeds were forgiven. Mm. Eric read the book. He didn't say anything. I read it a few days later and I'm really extremely angry that I was incandescent that this terrible man could feel he was forgiven when my dear husband had not yet forgiven him. Mm. So... I asked Eric, and I never did anything without asking him, because it was his life, whether I might write to Mr. Nagase and point out the fact that uh, my husband was still alive. And that led to a series of correspondence between Mr. Nagase and myself, which Eric, of course, read from, from my end, and he also read what came back. And eventually, after about six or seven letters, he was able to take over the correspondence, mm. which led again over time to him thinking that he could meet this man. But 
Uh, it was not quite as it seemed. He still felt very revengeful, and he wanted to meet him so he could kill him. And that was the position right up to the time of meeting him. Wow. That's not a drama created for the movie. That's... It definitely is not. Yeah. No, they, they, there is a scene, or there are scenes, very powerful scenes towards the end of the movie, which I believe are Eric's thoughts being acted out so that the audience knows what he had intended to do. And it's a truth. There's a lot of truth in that film. When you see Colin Firth and Nicole Kidman portraying your life, it, I imagine that can go one of two ways. One is they're doing a nice job of approximating you, or you're watching someone else's story played out. But how does it? Mm. How did it affect you? Well, for, with Nicole, uh, to, I was too close to make a judgment, quite truthfully. But my family, who were rather skeptical at her casting right at the beginning partly because of her different colouring, partly because she came from a different country, uh, when they saw the film, were very impressed with how she had managed to catch their mum, in essence. And they were, uh, yes, as I said, they're very impressed with that. Mm -hmm. As far as Colin was concerned, he got to know my husband very, very well. And... I have seen the film several times, and the more I see it, the deeper I go into it. And it's very often I get a jolt during a scene when Colin is my husband. Mm. He's a very, very clever actor. <laughs> and also I think we should mention young Jeremy Irvine, uh, the uh, actor who plays um, the younger Eric, because... He really, I think, went into that film very deeply. And this, I believe he had no uh, stand-in for any of the problems which are shown, which in itself shows great courage and commitment, I mm. think. Andy, you're still here. I'm here, yes. <laughs> when, did the, when did this story come to your attention? Much longer ago than you might imagine. We actually first read the book in 1999. Mm. And uh, so it's been kind of 14 years uh, bring it to the screen mm. partly because there was no point making a film unless we felt we could do something beyond the book and the book is a remarkable piece of writing um, partly because the story wasn't over yet we'd walked into into something still quite raw and when we asked Eric how he'd made that extraordinary journey from wanting to kill this man to finding a, a very different resolution he couldn't really explain it uh, so we had to do a lot of work to, to try and get inside his head. And um, Patty and Eric were incredibly generous in, in letting us talk to them and gradually find a way to make sense of it. Mm -hmm. And, of course, it's a, very, it's a very big story. So equally, I wasn't prepared to make a film if I couldn't do it on the sort of scale that it needed. Yeah. Um, and that's a difficult business to, to raise the kind of money that you need to, to go back into the jungles of Thailand and excavate the death railway and shoot these big scenes of, uh, of what happened there. Did you think about David Lean a lot while you were out there? Yeah, you tend not to mention The Bridge on the River Kwai because yeah. the, the veterans of the war despise the film. It's a wonderful piece of entertainment, but it has nothing to do with what they went through. Mm. Um, a lot of well-fed extras, the, uh, the British teaching the Japanese how to build a railway. Mm. Um, but I think more than that, the veterans felt that, that was the only way that people knew about what had happened to them. And because they were, you know, to a man, unable or unwilling to talk about their experiences, it was as if there was a fictional version of something out there and nobody had ever heard their story. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember Colin Firth saying to Eric, that, who, who worried that perhaps this had all come a bit late, that the story was going to be passed on and it was a very important story to pass mm -hmm. on. It's a, it's a powerful film and it's... Um... It's painful to watch, and it's a painful history, but that but that whole the whole essence of forgiveness that comes out of it is you know, it, re it redeems an irredeemable story. Well, you know, we thought long and hard about how how tough the movie needed to be. Oh, and also, how, how do you make that not seem like fake? Because it seems like a Hollywood ending. Yeah. In some ways. Well, I suppose speaking as one of the writers, one of the ways that you make it real is by handing it back to the real people at the end. I mean, all the words that come at the end of this film are words that were 
written or spoken by by those people. Mm. And you have to, well, if we've done our job correctly, you have to find the truth of the story in a way that, that makes sense as a movie so that by the time you get to the end, you know these people well enough um, that you can feel somehow that, uh, that it's the real words at the end. Patty Lomax, Andy Patterson. The film is The Railway Man, and it's in theaters now. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.